uh, make our way, please, to the to the seats so we can um, move on. Thank you. Last two people coming in. I uh, have given many, many talks in my life. I've introduced many people in my life before. And I told my 14-year-old son today I was petrified. And the reason why I was petrified is because you don't very often get the chance to introduce your childhood hero to an audience this big. That is uh, David Suzuki. Um, Like many of you, I grew up with David Suzuki, and so standing here before you, I'm about to introduce you as one of the great moments for me in my, my career. David Suzuki began his university career at Amherst College in Massachusetts. There he received a biology bachelor's degree with honors in 1958. Three years later, he obtained a PhD in zoology from the University of Chicago. His first academic appointment was as an assistant professor in the Department of Genetics at the University of Alberta. And in 1963, he relocated to UBC, where he continued his groundbreaking research in genetics, quickly rising through the ranks to become a full professor in zoology in 2009. Professor Suzuki retired from UBC in 2001, although to this day he remains a professor emeritus in the same department. Now, I have a little side story here that I don't think David actually knows about. Is my, did my PhD at UBC from 1985 to 1987. At the time, it was in the Department of Mathematics, but I was housed in the Department of Oceanography, which is in the basement of the Biological Sciences Building, which is where David Suzuki's fruit fly fridges were. <laughs> there used to be the most incredibly smelling days when these fruit, fruit fly fridges were open. So we had to live David Suzuki research on a daily basis as grad students. <laughs> it was also wonderful to know that he had, a, he had an amazing talent uh, of, of, of finding the only parking spot at UBC Biological Sciences that was available, because he had a media pass, too. And I remember being so very jealous until the time that I broke my leg playing rugby, when I, too, got a special pass. And I was able to park beside David Suzuki's car in the, in the biology uh, building down on the ramp there. I remember exactly where he used to park. And I ramp to the back of the biology building with your media pass. And I had my, uh, uh, my um, disabled pass. <laughs> David Suzuki, he's won an absolutely numerous scientific awards for his pioneering work in genetics. And these included a, a Stacy uh, Fellowship in 1969 as one of the top Canadian scientists under the age of 35 at the time. Um, now they've increased that so you can be under the age of 40 and get that prize. His election to the Royal Society of Canada was in 1978, and he was elected to the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 1980. And he's been awarded 28 honorary degrees from a variety of universities. I don't know whether you get to I'm going to have to work on that one as well. <laughs> Take that 29 as well. He's also won numerous national and international awards and honors for his for, for work as a broadcaster, science communicator, and environmentalist. And these include UNESCO's Kalinga Prize for Science, the UN Environment Program Medal, and the Right Li uh, Livelihood Award. He's best known in Canada, obviously, for this long-running and award-winning CBC television series, The Nature of Things with David Suzuki, and his more than 50 on, uh, general audience books on science and the environment. Together with his partner, the renowned environmentalist and writer Tara Cullis, he founded the David Suzuki Foundation in 1990. David Suzuki and the David Suzuki Foundation have emerged as leaders in Canada in the dissemination of information on the causes and consequences, as well as solutions to the problem of global warming. His numerous books, television, radio, and documentary programs, as well as his public presentations and engagement through media interviews, have been influential in shaping public opinion on climate change. On April the 12th, 2012, David Suzuki published an open letter discussing his decision to step down from the board of the directors of his foundation. In his letter, David Suzuki cited concerns that, quote, some governments, industries, and special interest groups use threats to the foundation's charitable status in attempts to mute its powerful voice on issues that matter deeply to you and many other Canadians. But David Suzuki has vowed to remain an outspoken advocate for science, the environment, and global warming solutions. Please join me in welcoming David Suzuki.
Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, when I stepped down from the board, I was free at last. So I can say whatever I want. First, though, may I thank the Songhees and the Squamaw people for caring for the land so long and uh, leaving it for us. I guess we took it. We didn't leave it for us to, uh, to enjoy. I'm delighted to be here today to speak at a rally for Donald. Where are you, Donald? Are you? Thank you. I, it's it's a privilege to have this opportunity. But really, Donald, I'm sorry. I'm here because my dear friend Elizabeth May, who is the godmother of my youngest daughter and who married my youngest daughter on Labor Day weekend, said I had to be here. So <laughs> here I am. But I'm happy to do so to be here and address this crowd today because. Greens understand, have always understood, there are limits to growth. Greens know that our well-being and our prosperity depend on a healthy biosphere. I only met Donald Galloway this evening, but I have known about his academic and human rights and social justice work, and I think that is a magnificent background. Greens are far more than just being about protecting trees and birds and, and all of that. I think that social justice, social justice issues are at the heart of uh, the Green Movement. This is uh, a distinguished man who has devoted his life to helping some of the most disadvantaged, not only in Canada, but around the world. And I thank Donald on behalf of all of us for the work that you've already done and for volunteering your time and effort now for the Green Party. The Green Party should be very, very proud to have a person of your stature running for the <laughs> Now, as uh, Chief Charlene said, you know, she has such high regard for elders. And in fact, I'm here to speak today to all of you as an elder. I'm in the last part of my life, what I refer to as the death zone. <laughs> so, because I'm at that stage in my life, no one can accuse me of a hidden agenda, of a secret desire for more fame or money or power. Any elder that's still after that has to see a doctor, they got problems. <laughs> and I found that as my testosterone levels drop, that I'm not thinking about sex all the time. I'm getting really smart. <laughs> this is the most important part of my life because elders have something no other group in society has. We have lived a lifetime. We have made mistakes. We've done, suffered failures. We've celebrated a few successes. We've learned a lot through that lifetime. So now we can sift through our lives, look for nuggets of experience, for lessons, for instructions that are worth passing on to the coming generation. So I urge my elders, get the hell off the couch, get off the golf course, and get on with the most important part of your life. We're not drains on the economy as we're being demonized now, drains because of our rising costs in Social Security or med medical costs. We are the repository of knowledge, of values, of wisdom, of history. And it's now our time to pass that on. I, uh, uh, I believe that it is a great privilege to live in a country that aspires to democracy with guarantees of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of movement, and equality before the law. But these are just words. And they're easy to say when times are good. The only time these freedoms and rights and guarantees matter is when times are tough. And if we can't guarantee them then, then democracy fails. You don't have a democracy. My father was born in Vancouver, BC in 1909. My mother in Vancouver in 1911. They lived their entire lives in Canada. When they became adults, they weren't allowed to vote in this country. They couldn't buy property in many parts of Vancouver and British Columbia. And they were denied access 
to many professions and universities in this province. I was born in Vancouver in 1936. In 1941, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, everything changed for us. As Canada applied the War Measures Act that suspended all rights of citizenship, froze our assets, and ultimately forced us to, to move to camps deep in the Rocky Mountains. When the war was drawing to an end, we in the camps were offered two choices. We could renounce our citizenship and receive a one-way ticket to Japan. Or if we wanted to stay in this country, we had to get the hell out of British Columbia and go east of the Rockies. As you might expect, most of the people in the camps were so disillusioned with this country that they signed up to go to Japan. My parents said, look, we've never been there. That's a foreign country. We're staying, and we're going to do all we can to try to make this country live up to what its ideals are claimed to be. My point, my point in recounting this is to remind you of how difficult it is to live up to the words that we mouth, to the grand notion of what our democracy is. Canada failed that test in, the war, in World War II, and Canada failed again in October 1970. We never get enough democracy. We always have to work hard to get more of it. I spent eight years in the United States getting an education that it wasn't possible to get in this country at that time. In 1957, I was beginning my final year at Amherst College in Massachusetts. And on October 4th, we were electrified to hear the announcement that the Soviet Union had launched Sputnik. We didn't know there was a, that there was a space program going on. And for any of you that were old enough to remember that time, while it was electrifying to know that we had actually launched a satellite, it was also terrifying because as the American rockets blew up on the launch pad, or took off and then blew up, blew up the Russians announced the first animal in space, a dog, Laika, the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, the first team of cosmonauts, the first woman, Valentina Tereshkova. And we realized how far advanced the, the Russians were in science, in engineering, and medicine. Thank goodness the Americans didn't roll over and say, hell, it'll cost too much. It'll destroy the economy to try to catch up. The Americans began to pour huge amounts of money into science, into universities, into research institutions, into students. Here I was, a foreigner living in the States, and all you had to do was say, Oh, I love science. And they threw money at you. It was a glorious period to be a scientist at, at that time. In 1962, I had received my PhD, and I'd spent a year of postdoctoral research. And to my amazement, without even applying, I was receiving job offers. I got a job offer at Stanford, at the University of California, Davis. And grant offers were pouring in. It was a huge amount of money uh, to try to catch up to the Russians. But I decided in 1962 that I wanted to return to Canada. Canada was different, not better, but different and for me, preferable. I returned to Canada because to me, Canada meant Tommy Douglas. It meant the CCF and Medicare. It meant, it meant equalization payments between the provinces. It meant the National Film Board, Quebec, the CBC and wilderness that is the envy of the, plant of the world. And I have never regretted returning to Canada. But now in the last part of my life, I see a Canada that is in danger of losing so many of the values that distinguished us from our neighbor to the south. We have a government that is run on law and order in every election, and yet once elected as a minority government, turned its back on the Kyoto Protocol. When Jean Chrétien ratified Kyoto, he didn't ratify that as a liberal. He ratified that as the Prime Minister of Canada, and he committed Canada to an international treaty. And when Mr. Putin ratified in, in, uh, um, in 2004, 
it became international law for all of the governments that had signed it. So here was a man who ran on a law and order plank every single election, and yet who, upon being elected, then said, I'm not going to pay any attention to Kyoto. In other words, he was turning his back on an internationally binding treaty and declaring that Canada is an international outlaw. And I'm completely confused about what is meant by law and order then. This is a man who shortly after being elected passed a law mandating elections every four years on a set date and he broke his own law within a few months and called it an election. What on earth does law and order mean with the Harper government? We, uh, at Rio, I returned for the 20th anniversary of the 1992 uh, Earth Summit in Rio. I went this time to be a babysitter for my daughter, but I did get uh, my delegate's badge. And at one point, I was in the uh, meeting uh, building and uh, got into an elevator, and in came a delegate from Africa who simply looked at my badge and he said, oh, you're from Canada. And I said, yes, I am. He said, why do you even bother coming? Your country is doing everything to destroy this process. I can't tell you how, humili how humiliating it was to see what our government has reduced Canada to in the international scene. I, uh, our government has bypassed parliamentary debate a potential vote that might have brought it down by proroguing government, not just once, but twice. Our government has allowed a non-elected Senate to shoot down a bill that had passed through the House, mandating Canada to meet the Kyoto target. Our government is cutting funding for scientists and research, laying off government scientists, canceling Arctic research programs on climate change, pulling funding from one of Canada's great contributions to the world, the experimental lake area. And we have canceled the long-form census that is the best indicator of the state of uh, Canada, a good snapshot of the country. Our government is muzzling scientists so they can vet whatever comes out of science through government policy. This government rams through legislation, as Elizabeth recounted, that undercuts 50 years of hard-won legislation, hiding it in an omnibus bill that is rammed through without any inspection or critical uh, judgment, as, as Elizabeth said again, not a single amendment. This is not democracy. This government claims the economy is its highest priority. Well, if that was true, why on earth are they ignoring the implications of climate change? Every economist will tell you the consequences of allowing climate change to continue as it is, to allow emissions to climb as, as they are, will be catastrophic in, to the economy of the world. Our Prime Minister has never said a word, not a word about the reality of human-induced climate change, or that it is something that we have to deal with. Instead, he canceled the few programs the Liberals had implemented to try to get some kind of uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And he uh, argues that in order to, er, to, it, to attempt to reduce emissions will be to ruin the economy, because we're a northern country cold country, we need a lot of energy, and we're an industrialized country, and our industry demands our heavy uh, fossil fuel use. And I say, wait a minute now, what kind of nonsense is that? I mean, that's, those are all words, but what about Sweden, for God's sake? Sweden is a northern country like us. They're a big industrial nation, and yet since 1991, they imposed a carbon tax. Today, they pay $140 a ton to put carbon into the atmosphere. They have reduced greenhouse gas emissions over 8% below 1990 levels. Not that phony baloney uh, baseline that our government has imposed of 2010, below 1990 levels, past the Kyoto target. And during that time, they've had the carbon tax. Their economy grew by 44%. Mr. Harper says the economy is his expertise and concern, and yet he deliberately, he deliberately ignores the example of what Sweden 
has done to tell us we can't afford to do anything to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Canada is the most in vulnerable industrialized country, vulnerable to climate change of any of the countries around the world. Why? Well, obviously, we're a northern country, as Mr. Harper tells us. And we know that the warming is going on at a much greater rate in the northern part of the, of the planet than in the, in the temperate or even the uh, uh, Arctic air, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, equatorial areas of the planet. We're going through it, as the Inuit have been telling us for over 20 years now, the evidence is all there. The planet is getting warmer. We are the, a country with the longest marine coastline of any country in the world. When water warms, it expands. Sea level rise from thermal expansion will affect Canada more than any other country in the world. And when those great ice sheets over Greenland and Antarctica Arctica, begin to fall in great amounts into the oceans, we're going to see rises not in tens of centimeters, but in meters. And that will be absolutely catastrophic for Canada. And then you think about our economy. And surely our economy is made up of, of uh, climate-affected areas like agriculture, forestry. British Columbia has already lost $65 billion worth of pine trees because our winters aren't cold enough to control the mountain pine beetle. We are a, a country dependent on fisheries, on tourism, and on winter sports. So to say that the economy is our concern and ignore climate change it seems to me is absolutely irresponsible. And I'm wondering, I think that it's criminal. There should be intergenerational <laughs> there, should be, there should be legal means to hold our leaders accountable for intergenerational crime. We know now what we are doing is going to reverberate more and more intensely through the lives of our children and grandchildren. This is uh, criminal negligence on the part of our, our elected representatives. And I believe there is a category that should be uh, applied. It's called willful blindness. You can put people in jail if there are areas that they should know about, but they deliberately ignore them as they go about their activities. Willful blindness is what's going on in Ottawa now. And I think that if there are any lawyers in the room, for heaven's sakes, you ought to look into that. There's something to hold people accountable for what they are doing. We, uh, <laughs> so while, being, while being willfully blind then to, to climate, what does Mr. Harper do? He demonizes environmentalists. We're called obstructionists. We're called radical extremists. We're called agents of foreign funders. <laughs> and there is someone using robocalls to de deflect people from actually being able to go and vote properly. And I can tell you, as someone who knows, my parents couldn't vote until after the, the Second World War. I take the right to vote as one of the most precious things, precious rights that we have in a democracy. And people that are trying to screw up even our right to vote by deliberately sidetracking us, it seems to me every person that cares about democracy ought to be demanding an inquiry into that pernicious act instead of trying to... <laughs> instead of trying to get the Council of Canadian suit tossed out of court. We are assaulted by vicious attack ads that are sickening as far as I'm concerned. We're driven by a government that seems to be uh, driven by a corporate agenda, not an agenda for people. And when 40% of Canadians fail to vote, and governments can be elected with a majority government, with 39 or 40% of those that do vote, I don't think we have a democracy any longer. We have some kind of tyranny of a minority. And when Alan Gregg, a prominent conservative pollster, tells us Mr. Harper is undermining public discourse to run government by ideology, we are in trouble. We have to get involved. That's what you're all here for. It's more than just a matter of voting. 
We all have to get out on the streets, I hope, with this size of an audience. If you get out on the streets and think of the number of people that you can contact, we've got a huge, huge constituency out there that you can reach. And I, I wish you luck. I thank you for coming this evening and being a part of that. We've got to get involved. I believe we have to aim to make voting a civic responsibility and maybe a requirement the way they do in Australia. We have, to, we have to stop corporate funding of political candidates. You know, we have to. And Elizabeth, I'm sorry that you didn't mention the fact that we had a policy where taxpayers subsidized parties if you got enough of the vote. Mr. Harper canceled that. We should be going to where any candidate who is quali has qualified should be subsidized completely by taxpayers. And that way we won't see these obscene amounts of money being spent on campaigning. But then whoever is elected is beholden to the taxpayer, the public. That's the way it should be. And yet, and yet Mr. Harper got away with just canceling that without a peep. What the heck is going on? We, uh, I've lost my, uh, my notes here now. <laughs> we need ultimately proportional representation like most of the democracies in the world. And what a, how amazing it is that Mr. Campbell actually gave us a chance to vote on that in British Columbia. That was a remarkable thing. And then he pulled back from it. And because uh, people began to oppose this thing and we came within a whisker of passing it. We need to have a huge campaign now to get proportional representation uh, as something that we in, uh, invoke in our, uh, our governments. We're being told that development of Alberta's tar sands is Alberta's business. So now we have a federal government that's saying, we're going to restrict those that can uh, appear before the Environmental Assessment uh, uh, Board, those people with a, 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 a direct vested interest in that pipeline. And I say, well, I'm all for Alberta doing any damn thing they want with their tar sands. Dig it up, burn it, pollute the water, poison the people, I don't care, as long as whatever they do stays within Alberta. <laughs> right? Well, of course, that's absurd. So if, it, if you can't keep what you're doing in, in your own political boundaries, then it seems to me everybody on the planet has a big stake in what happens with the Northern Pipeline. And <laughs> we, have to, we have to become engaged in the political process. You see, we are at a critical point in all of human history. What we do or do not do in the next few years is going to determine whether we even survive as a species. Now that sounds like a pretty melodramatic statement, and it is. You don't have to believe me or, or even listen to me if you don't want. But how about somebody with a little more authority? How about uh, Sir Martin Rees, the Royal Astronomer in the United Kingdom? One of the eminent scientists who was asked recently on BBC, what are the chances human beings will be around by the end of the 21st, uh, 20, uh, by 2100? And his answer was 50-50. What about uh, uh, Jim Lovelock, who coined the expression, the term Gaia, to talk about the, the collective of all life on Earth, whose latest book says that the, the planet has a fever caused by human activity, and that by the year 2100, over 90% of us will be gone. Well, I'll be gone, but I mean 90% of the population of the world at that time <laughs> will be gone. Or how about Clive Hamilton, an eco-philosopher from Australia, a man I have enormous respect for, who wrote a, a book in the 1990s called Affluenza, and now he's written a book called Requiem for a Species. And guess what species it's a requiem for? I've read the book from cover to cover. There's nothing in it I disagree with. My, I'm grateful to the sense of urgency that comes from their messages. But if they insist that it's too late, my message to them is 
thank you very much for what you said. Now, please go away and shut up. <laughs> because I don't think there's any point in saying it's too late. We don't know enough to say it's too late. But even if it really was too late to go back, we're going to fight to the end anyway. We don't just toss up our hands and say, oh, well, it's too late. I'm not going to do anything. But I think it's, it's, uh, uh, it just weakens us. It uh, demoralizes us to say it's too late. I don't think it's Pollyanna-ish to say we don't know enough to say it's too late. And I want to cite an example that you all know about. You know the most precious, the most precious species of, or commercially precious species of salmon in the world is the sockeye salmon. The largest run of sockeye salmon in the world is in the Fraser River. And while runs are, re are radically reduced from uh, pre-contact days, when runs of sockeye in the Fraser were over 100 million, we have, uh, in the last 100 years, thought that any run over 30 million is a, is a big, good, healthy run. And as you know, three years ago, the run was down to just over one million. And I said to my wife at the time, I think that's it. There's just not enough biomass going up to that river to really per perpetuate the species. Obviously, it's a catastrophic decline. One year later, we got the biggest run in 100 years. Now, I use this story not to show how stupid I am. <laughs> Because as you know from the Cohen Commission, we don't have a clue what the hell's going on. We don't know enough. We have no idea why we went from such a dismal run to such a huge run. But what it says to me is nature has a hell of a lot of secrets. Because our knowledge is so limited, we can hope that if we can pull back and give nature a chance, she will be much more forgiving than we deserve. So at this point, it's not, we, sh we should not be saying it's too late, hoping nature is forgiving, but taking the message that it is very, very late. It's very urgent. We face a global eco-crisis because we, as a species, are now exceeding the carrying capacity of the biosphere. We are on a, on a, a, a trajectory that is absolutely unsustainable. Taking care of the environment should be deeply embedded in society as a part of our culture. And when that happens, we won't need a Green Party anymore because all parties will take that as a part of what they are working towards protecting. Yeah. But as we become more and more of an urban animal, rather than a creature that spends time outdoors, as farmers do, as traditional people do, then we live in a world dominated by computers and electronic gadgetry, and we lose sight of Mother Nature that sustains us all. In cities, our jobs become our highest priority because we need a job to earn the money to buy the things that we want. And so the economy then, for an urban animal, and 80 to 85% of Canadians now are urban creatures, are the economy seems to be the source of everything that we need. Oh yeah, we, we need a few parks out there where we can go camping. As long as we have parks and a few reserves, then who needs nature? My job is the most important thing, and I hope Mr. Harper can do everything he can to keep the economy going so that I can keep my job. Greens understand that the economy is a means to something else, to something better, we hope, but it's certainly not the end we now seem to be serving the economy as if it's some kind of entity that's, I don't know, it's, it's just got to be served. We've just got to keep it growing. You know, 300 years ago, people believed in dragons and demons. I mean, they really believed in them, right? And in order to keep them off our backs, we gave them gold and jewels and sacrificed virgins, anything to keep them off our backs, right? Well, today... Nobody believes in dragons or demons, right? We know they were figments of our imagination. So, but what do we do? We substitute it with another figment of our imagination called the economy. And boy, if we think the economy's pissed off at us, we'll give it gold. Look at what Mr. Obama and Mr. Bush did in 2008. Hundreds of billions of dollars to the banks that created the problem in the first place just to say, get the economy going. You know, we don't have any virgins left, but we'll give them jewels, we'll give them whatever we want, please. And, you know, I mean, what the hell is going on? 
on. Before the election in the United States, Mitt Romney was quoted as saying, if Mr. Obama is re-elected, the market is going to be very unhappy. <laughs> We've created this entity and we act as if it's got to be served, but we never ask, what is an economy for? Are there no limits? How much is enough? Are we happier with all this stuff? We've got to get this economy back under control and supporting us to go for higher goals than just more stuff. And growth, but for its own sake, is a ludicrous goal to aim at. Greens inform us that ecos is the Greek word meaning household or domain. Economy is the management of our household or our domain. Our domain is the biosphere. Ecology is the study of our domain or our household. Ecologists try to determine what are the conditions of sustainability for any species. So econom economics and ecology should be companion disciplines with econ economists saying to the ecologist, tell us what the conditions are. And then we'll design an economy that will fit within it. So let's put the eco back into economics and get it back into it. context, I hope to provide you with why you're here and what the job is now. The job is to go out and start raising these issues and seeing which candidates for office are actually going to confront the kinds of issues that the Greens understand to their very DNA and their core. So again, thank you, Don. Thank you, Donald, for offering yourself for this very, very tough challenge. The people are here today, I think to say they appreciate it. They're gonna be all out there beating the doors for you, as I will be for Andrew Weaver when he runs for office next year. Thank you very much. when that election started, all of the uh, registered charities in Canada got a warning note from the Canadian Revenue Agency saying, be very careful not to say anything that could be interpreted as partisan at all. Including, and this was the very first kind of thing that this ever happened, that we couldn't possibly uh, uh, put out uh, quizzes and questionnaires to candidates and publish the results. Sierra Club of Canada wasn't a charity, so we were able to publish our results, but I could see where it was gonna be harder and harder to speak out. And David had to take this very tough decision to leave the board of his organization, which is no longer his organization, which is why he was free. So I want to thank David from the bottom of my heart for being here. This was a rare, rare treat. And hearing him speak of democracy has inspired me to do even more in the House of Commons. <laughs> but you'll find the doors barred. Uh, <laughs> no worry, it's a democracy, but I need you to hear from Donald Galloway. This is a friend of mine, I say this very, very, with great pride. We've known each other for almost 30 years. He started inviting me to his class at Queen's Law School way back in the day for me to explain environmental law. We've worked together for all of that time as friends and as colleagues, and since I've been an elected member of parliament, one of the people I could turn to for expert advice on legislation on immigration and refugee matters, but also on the omnibus bills and also on the Canada-China Treaty. Donald has been helping me at every stage because he's got a brilliant mind and he's a quick study and he figures this stuff out. While well, others are still wondering where the book is, he's read it. So I want to say that it's with great, it's such an honor for me to have Donald Galloway stand as the Green Party nominee 
for Victoria, and I give you now, with your help, with mine, with every fiber in my being, I believe that I am now introducing to you the next member of Parliament for Victoria, John McGallagher. She said, well, it's up to you. And I said, well, uh, how about we just send the check in and support her uh, once more, and let's spend a quiet evening together. And then it struck me, now this is absolutely wrong. I have a fatherly obligation to introduce a 12-year-old at the time to Elizabeth May. She, my daughter had never met Elizabeth May, and I thought this is something that a father would be a disgrace if he had an opportunity to do this, but he, uh, he didn't do it because he was tired. So I said, let's get in the car and let's go to this thing. And we went to the thing, and uh, it was an incredibly pleasant evening. And just as I was about to go, Elizabeth pulled me aside and said, you wouldn't be interested in, and she didn't get the words out of her mouth, and I said, yes. <laughs> My brain was in neutral at that time. I wasn't thinking. I hadn't actually explained it to my partner, Hester, that uh, I was uh, threatening to change our life totally. But it was an automatic decision for me. It was something of an epiphany. I had to do it. I had to do it not because I have political ambitions, but I had to do it in order to orchestrate the downfall of this government. For the last two years, I have been teaching three-quarter time in order to spend time working on issues that uh, are incredibly technically legally, but were raised by some bills that the government had introduced. The refugee laws that the Harper government has introduced over the last three years are, have been some of the most vicious, vindictive laws that I have seen. They are clearly unconstitutional. The, the bills that were passed through, par through Parliament have gone through the Ministry of Justice, which has to certify that these laws are constitutional. This process of certification is clearly a sham. Some friends who are lawyers and academics and I got together to form the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers. We were shocked by this legislation. Let me tell you the sort of thing that it did and is going to do. It imposed mandatory detention on every child that enters Canada irregularly. The detention was going to be unreviewable by any court of law for an indeterminate period. Kids were going to be thrown in jail without any access to judicial review. Even those people that were found to be refugees, even those people that were going to become members of our society, we were told were going to be, are going to be, separated from their families for five years in order to deter other people from doing this very thing. This is the life that we are now living. These are the stories that they are, they are hidden by xenophobic statements about the importance to look after our own first. These are the stories that are informing the legislation. 
When I decided to accept Elizabeth's uh, offer, I knew that in the back of my mind that it's only if you get into Parliament to fight the issues from the inside can you actually make a difference. For two years, I've been working on the outside with academics and with lawyers who are the best lawyers in the country. I was working in order to get the issues into the hands of MPs so that they could stir the pot in Parliament and get something done. In my experience, there was only one MP that I came across who actually knew what she was talking about when she was dealing with these bills, and that was Elizabeth May. The others I had to, I had to uh, explain in detail. I was of the, the organization I formed, I was the chair of the legal research group. I had to write out over and over again briefs that explained again and again and again what these issues were. Elizabeth got it first time. She didn't have to be told what these laws were about. The only success that I thought could be gained if she had given support. And of course, the issues that I've been working on are only a small part of what the Harper administration has been doing. I considered them important because I saw, and I've worked with refugees for a number of years, I saw their importance. But I am not a, uh, a, I'm not an individual who focuses on narrow issues. I focus on immigration and refugee issues be because they count. But also counting are our criminal justice laws. Are we really going to, ex to, to enforce Texas-based notions that you jail people for the possession of six marijuana plants, that you overcrowd our prisons, that you, you destroy res restorative justice programs that actually work? Is this the world that we're actually going into? I say no, this is not the world. This is not the world that we want to live in. really going to live in a world where our rights to privacy against internet surveillance are going to be cut right back? No, I say that's not the world that we're going to live in. Are we going to live in a world where our environmental laws are being gutted? No, that's not my world too. Listen, I came to Canada in 1975. I had spent some time in North America before that, first as an exchange student during the height of the anti-war uh, uh, campaigns. I came back as a graduate student. I knew my life was going to be in North America. I came to Canada. I came to Canada because I found it, its culture, I found its politics, I found its people to be warm, friendly, and communitarian oriented. That's the life that I chose. I could have chosen to go elsewhere, but I chose this society. This society has now disappeared, and I am ready to fight for it back. <laughs> On Canada Day, a few years ago, Stephen Harper described Canada as a warrior nation. The nation I joined was not a warrior nation, it was a peacekeeping and peacemaking nation. <laughs> Harper's Canada is okay with torture, as long as it happens under extraordinary rendition in countries that we have never heard of far away. We now take and use information gained from brutalizing people. That's not the Canada that I chose to join. I want us to denounce torture and stand firm on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I want my country back. restore our traditions of diplomacy, peacekeeping, and peacemaking. I want my country back. I want to 
you know that the most desperate and marginalized people on this planet will have a fair hearing when they make it to our shores? I want to ensure they will be offered necessary health care when they get here. I want my country back. I want to know that we will join the responsible nations of the planet and move to a low carbon economy. I want to know my daughter's future will not be threatened by climate change. I want my country back. I want the government to respond to the Committee on the Rights of the Child, which noted that the provision of welfare services to Aboriginal children, to African Canadian children, and children of other minorities is not comparable in quality and accessibility to services provided to other children in Canada and is not adequate to meet their needs. I want my country back. We know what one MP can do in Canada. Elizabeth has given us hope. Two of us can double that hope. We can inspire more Canadians to join us. We will all say with one voice, we want our country back. <laughs> if you wake up on the 27th of November with a green MP, I put it to you, you will feel both joy and hope. I think the world will be a better place. Thank you. and I, I, I did have a, have a chance to vote for a change. But my parents who are sitting there, they live in your right. They're going to be voting for you as well. So we have, uh, uh, they, they get the chance to vote in, in uh, Victoria for the next BNP Ottawa. We're not done yet. We have a final special um, a conclusion. We're going to ask Dan Mangan to come back to the stage and play us a couple more.
Ticker tape on me. If only I'd know. May see the. Actually, a brand new song that I've never played, and I will forget some lyrics. Um, but it, it involved the term willful blindness, which I this is kind of a call to arms. Deal came to be 
This is how Dio came to be. I could really use the decency of you. I am so fed up with all of you. Present company excluded. All oh, this suffice to say, I'll come back from being away. Get complacent and unawake. Back to my senses. But you could be the whistleblower. So many of you helped out to make tonight a success. Donald and I are incredibly grateful to you, and uh, I'll pass over to Donald too for the final words. I just want to say thank you very much for showing up tonight. It's been a magnificent night. It really has been a celebration, and I hope we've inspired you. I hope we've inspired you to vote. Thanks. Let's make a change. Okay? Let's make a change. And if you enjoyed tonight's evening, just wait to see the event we have planned for November the 26th when Donald Galloway is elected to Ottawa.
You can. What if I don't? You don't have to link. Well, you don't have.